Well, it has been a long time uh, since we were in the Book of Mark. In the Book of Mark, we were uh, in there in the month of March, uh, and then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, our world changed, did it not? So when we got uh, to the Book of Mark, or got to the month of uh, March, uh, we needed to make a change anyway, just because of how things were going in the Book of Mark, and we moved over to the Book of uh, James. Uh, because that was a, you know, I found a relevant book for a time where we're going through certain trials and difficulties. Uh, we've made it back to Mark. Okay, so we'll be in Mark here, I think, until uh, Resurrection Sunday. I think that's how it'll work out uh, if I've got things timed out correctly. But that's always, you know, <laughs> that's always a bit of a challenge. So since it's been a while, since we've been almost six months without the book of Mark, we need to do a little bit of a recap. I'm not going to do the, the whole recap of the book of Mark, but certainly the, the ninth chapter. Uh, today we will be in Mark chapter 9, and starting in verse 14, but we at least need to see uh, where are we uh, in the ninth chapter. So the ninth chapter, the, the big giant thing which we see here is we see that Jesus and three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up to what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And as they go up there, we see that Jesus is transformed. He is transfigured before them, and it's as if the energy and the glory of God is, is, is emanating from him. Uh, and, uh, of course, in this incredible moment we have here, uh, Peter, who has a, a great tendency of putting his foot uh, directly into his mouth, and he says, hey, this is awesome. Uh, we see Moses here, we see Elijah here, and there you are, Jesus, and let's build three little huts right here to commemorate this, uh, to which uh, there is an immediate response, and it's a response from uh, the voice of God the Father in verse 7, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Okay, and it's something which I believe knocks them to their to their to their noses, and uh, they're bowed down before him. And so we see here this incredible view of uh, a glimpse, if you will, of the glory of Jesus Christ, the the glory of the second person of the Trinity. Here he is, and we hear the voice of God. So that's you've got four people up there. You have Jesus, and you've got three disciples. Uh, a pretty amazing type of thing. But even on the way down, what we see is we see that Jesus begins to inform them that the glory which they saw on the mountaintop was only one type of glory, for he is going to inform them that they will at one time see another type of glory, one which they do not at this particular point have a comprehension or an understanding. If you go to verse 9, so in 9.9, 9, as they were coming down from the mountain, he, that is Jesus, charged them so no, <clears throat> to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning this rising from what this rising from the dead might mean. Because what they have seen is they have just seen something which they have never seen before, something which is so incredible that Jesus is shiny, he's all glowy, and they, they're looking at him and they're saying, uh, how in the world, Jesus, that you're, you're alive and kicking, and what are you talking about rising from the dead? This to them is something which is mystifying. And uh, they're discussing this, but they're discussing it among themselves. Now, they're coming from the high point. They're coming da back down into the valley. And, I have, and we see as they're coming off the mountaintop and as they are coming into the valley, we see that there is an immediate meet, need. And I have always found this interesting because I have found that ministry is almost always done not on the mountaintop, but it is done upon the slopes. It is done in the valley. And Jesus, as he comes down from the mountaintop, experience, he comes down into the valley of need. He comes down into the valley of trouble. And as he comes down there, he finds the disciples, which he's left behind, and they're already in the middle, in the, in the middle of, a, of, a, of a crisis, of a problem. So let's turn. That's our, that's our background. That's our setting. So let's go to Mark chapter 9, and we'll pick it up into verse 14. And like I said, we'll go through verse 19, excuse me, not 19, verse 29 today. So in verse 14, we read this, and when they came to the disciples, that is, the disciples who had not gone up on the mountain, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them, and immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. So we see that the disciples are having difficulty. They're having difficulty with the legal experts, the scribes. We don't know the content of the argument, but they're having an argument. So here they are, and the disciples seem to not be doing so well. Uh, you know what this reminds me of? It just reminds me of, here comes Jesus, and it's like in high school when, people, when two guys are going to get in a fight in high school. Do people fight in high school anymore? 
Yeah, they do. And I remember when I was in high school, you know, they, you know, people would get in a fight. You know, somebody pushes somebody, somebody pushes somebody else. And you know what happens? You know exactly what happens. The two guys are there, and you, all of a sudden you get this immediate ring, right? Because people are excited to see a fight. So, whew. good times, right? <laughs> Not so much. All right, so here we have it. We have a, a crowd, and they're around the scribes. They're around the disciples. They, they're looking for a fight. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, and they recognize Jesus, and they say, oh, wait a second. This is the guy that, 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 is, that is causing all the miracles. This is the guy that we really want to see. So let's leave the ring, and let's, take over, let's run over to Jesus. Verse 16. And Jesus, he asked them, he says, what are you arguing about with them? What's the problem here, fellas? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. It's interesting to me because Jesus is, is, is talking to, um, we're not certain if he's talking to the scribes or if he's talking to the disciples, you know, essentially, what's the problem? And what we find here is we find a man who, quite frankly, doesn't care about their argument. He cares about his son, which he had brought with him so that Jesus, Jesus could heal him. So here we have this man, and he says, hey, hey, hey. Let's not worry about a great, big, giant theological argument. I brought my son, and my son needs compassion. And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought, you, or I brought my son to you. Okay, Sort of implied here, I got stuck with the flunkies of the disciples. I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. You know, here I am, and, and, and I, I, I've come to you, and you weren't here, so I went, to the, I went to, the, you know, to the next group. Actually, it's not even the next group, because Peter, James, and John would probably be you know, group B. And here we have group C, right? And, and these guys can't do diddly, okay? To use a technical term. And Jesus looks at this, and he's come off the mountain. He comes into the valley of need, and what is his answer? He says, oh, faithless generation. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. You know, it's interesting, as you read the different commentaries, the, the question is, is, who is the faithless generation? Is it the people in general? Is it the disciples? And I think it's got to be a general term. I think he's talking about the, the crowd in general, but I think that must include the disciples. I read one commentary, they were trying to ex, you know, exclude the disciples from this group, but surely they must be included. The, they are not understanding, they're not believing as they should. And the lack of faith, ladies and gentlemen, is an ongoing problem within, uh, w- within Scripture. Matter of fact, if we go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the very first part of it, it says, that, and that without faith it is impossible to please Him. That is, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's not possible. I mean, some people think, say, oh, it's just faith, that's not that important. Sorry, it's not possible to please God without faith. We correspond, we, we communicate with God through faith. Not through deception, not through superstition, but through faith. If there's no faith, ladies and gentlemen, there's no relationship with God. And the importance of faith is very, very marked in the book of Mark. We see it over and over and over again. And again, since it's been such a long time, let me recap a little bit. Matter of fact, let me have you turn a little bit. Uh, Mark chapter 2 and verse 5. We'll just stay completely in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 2 and in verse 5, we get this really cool story of the man who is the paralytic, and it is the faith of the friends, the faith of the friends. They, they, they bring this man, uh, uh, they bring this man, uh, and they tear up the roof and let the man down through the, the roof to, to come to Jesus. In verse 5, 2, 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, it's a pretty cool story here. I mean, really, the story is not, com- uh, don't get me wrong, the point of the story is not about these guys who have faith. But it is, the story is about Jesus, don't, don't get me wrong here, but faith is important. It's crucial. If you go to chapter 4 and verse 40, we have Jesus and the disciples. There they are in the boat, and it's, it, it's, it's a, a ma- massive storm, and Jesus stands up and he says, peace, be still. And in verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Where is it at, guys? Why are you not believing? 
You judge your outside circumstances. You see the, the waves against you. You see the wind against you. But don't you understand who you have in the boat? Think about that with the disciples. Jesus has just come off of the Mount of Transfiguration, and granted, only three of the disciples have seen it. And here comes Jesus, and here he is. He is the one who can stop the waves. He's the one who can control everything. But ladies and gentlemen, we correspond, we interact with God through faith. But faith is, 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 is rare. We see the men who let the, the man down on the pallet. We see Jesus dealing with his disciples who have lack faith. In chapter 5 and verse 34, we see a woman who has, you know, the issue of blood, and she has to, in her mind, say, if only I can touch the fringe of his garments, I will be healed. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Two verses later, we see the synagogue leader who was, who was asking Jesus to come and to help his child. And we get the, the woman, she's sort of in between, she's sort of an in-between story here. And here's the synagogue leader, and people come up to him and says, oh, it's too late, your child is dead. And the man is, is, is about ready to freak out, to which Jesus is to only believe. We see in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus cannot do many miracles because there is the unbelief of the people in his own hometown. And then in chapter 7, we see the Syrophoenician woman whose persistence leads to a miraculous event. Faith, 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 faith. And we go back to that, that summary statement in Hebrews chapter 11 and 6a. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And here is Jesus. He's got, some of his, he's got all of his disciples around him. Now some of them have seen him on the mount. The rest of them are in the valley. And Jesus is active in his ministry in the valley. And he says, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring them to me. Bring them over. So we have an audience which lacks faith. We have disciples who lack faith. But we have Jesus who knows exactly what he's going to do. He has come off the mountain and he is down to ministry. And in verse 20, And they brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw him, immediately, Mark likes the word immediately, you see it a lot, immediately it convulsed. It convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming in his mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire, into the water to destroy him. Now look at this one here. But, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That's one of the, the, the most fascinating little uh, phrases that we have here. If you can. Jesus, if you can. That's an amazing statement because he doesn't fully comprehend who he's speaking to. If you can. And even Jesus, if you will, sort of shakes his head. <laughs> if, if you can, huh? If you can. Look at the next, look at verse 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can. Now in the ESV, they actually put that in parentheses. What Jesus is doing is he is referencing the words which the man has just said. Literally, if you look at the Greek, it's the if you can. And what you have is you have an article of previous reference. It's looking at, at that little phrase, if you can, and he's taking it from beforehand, and he's bringing it here, if you can. Oh, yes, I can. Watch it, buddy. Here it comes. I mean, it's pretty cool. And Jesus says, if you can, there's, you could almost put a question mark plus an exclamation mark there. And he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. Boom. All things. Now, Jesus says this without any type of qualification. All things. But we must understand that it has to be somewhat qualified, do we not? I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously if you have a crazy person and they, and they take a, a running start and they jump off a 20-story building and they believe that they can do it, is going to go splat, yes? Okay, so don't go splat on me, okay? We don't want that. Well, Jesus said, if I believe, all, you know, I can do anything. Obviously, what he is, you have to qualify this. A person who believes and believes, obviously, in the things which God wants to be done, obviously, okay? Things which are in accord to God's will. Even God can't do everything. And you're like, oh, that's heresy. God can't sin, Right? When we talk about the, uh, the, the omnipotence of God, the all-powerfulness of God, we talk about that God could do all things which he desires to do. 
all things which are consistent with his nature. God can't sin. That's not a possibility for God, okay? So even God doesn't do all things because all things are not righteous, okay? So when we uh, look at the idea of omnipotence, it's not the idea that God can do everything. No, he does, he does all things which are consistent with his will and desire. And so when Jesus says this, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Now, I don't want to dilute this down so much that we say, oh, well, <laughs> uh, I guess we'll just make this a pretty generic statement. No, he wants this to be a strong statement. All things which are in the will of God, all things which are, are in God's design can be done, but it must be cooperated with in faith. Remember, let, let's turn there to, in Mark chapter, just back a couple, verse, uh, couple pages, Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. I'll pick it up in verse 4. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Why? And he marveled because of their unbelief. We have a God who is excited to do great and mighty things and rejoices mightily when people come alongside in unbelief. But notice here, we have something else. We see a great, the great humanity of the man. So we have this father, and he's brought his son. And it's in verse 24, he says, immediately, there's the word immediately again, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. I believe. Jesus, I, I brought my son to you because nobody else can do anything. Your disciples couldn't do anything, but I brought him to you. I brought him to you. Please. But notice what he says right afterwards. I believe, and he says, help my unbelief. Doesn't that resonate with you? I mean, a lot of you say, well, I'm a person of belief. I'm a person of faith, and I, I trust Jesus Christ. Okay. Fantastic. I'm glad that's the case. But we, all of us, pastors included, have times where there are times of great difficulty and we're in the valley of doubt, we're in the shadow of the valley of death, we're having a great difficulty, we're looking at the walls against us, and we say, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I don't know what to do. I believe, but then again, I, 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 not, not so much. This is a man who, who, is, who is being very, very legitimate, very, very authentic. He's saying, I believe, but then again, boy, it's your heart. And as you live the Christian life, God doesn't say, oh, you come to Jesus, now all peaches and cream and everything is great. God allows us to go through, go through those difficulties. He lets us go through those trials. He lets us to go through those valleys. And at times we wondered, can I hold on to my faith? Right? We don't, we don't have to go, for, we can look at biblical example. Look at Gideon. Here's a guy who's involved in all kinds of amazing, miraculous interventions by God, yet we see him constantly struggling. I believe it helped my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came, they came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, it, saying to it, now, once again, you say, Jesus, why do you keep on avoiding the crowds? Well, at some point, I believe Jesus has made a determination that he has to be, be known as more than a miracle worker. The miracles are designed to point to who he is. The miracles are not an end in and of themselves. So he sees yet more people coming. Here they are clamoring to see what's going on. And when he set, sees that, he says, I've, you know, I'm going to get the work done. And he says, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Jesus does his work. By the way, it's interesting that it's much worse before it gets better. Is it not? Now, this is pretty cool. We could have ended the, the section right here. You know, Mark could have said, okay, that's, that, that's enough. We'll just stop right here with the miracle. Jesus comes over, grabs the boy, lifts him up, 
people think he's dead. I mean, it's, so, he's, it's such a traumatic experience for him. But Jesus takes him by the hand. He lifts him up. The man, the, he, he is walking about. But we get a, a, a little bit of an addition. We get a debriefing, right? And the debriefing we find in verses 28 and 29. And here what we see is we see that there is an explanation of why the miracle didn't happen when the disciples tried And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? You know what they're saying here? What was wrong with us? Why couldn't we do it? Right? Look look what Jesus says. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Did you notice what's missing in this passage? Jesus doesn't pray. Like, wait a second. All Jesus does, he tells the he he says, "Mute and deaf spirit, uh, I command you to come out of him." And you look at this and say, "Well, that's not a that's not a prayer. That's a speech to the deaf and mute spirit." And and he came out. And so, uh, is the prayer not recorded? Is, did something happen? That what, what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? What I, what I propose to you is this is that the prayer which Jesus has been praying, he's been praying well beforehand. Jesus has a life of prayer. It is a life which is marked by prayer. He could have prayed to that particular point, but he has been praying an awful lot. And my guess is that the disciples are a people who have begun to take it for granted that, hey, we're with Jesus, so it's all good, and they have forgotten to put their dependence upon an almighty God. Walter Wessel writes this, he says, Apparently they had taken for granted the power given them or had come to believe that it was inherent in themselves, so they no longer depended prayerfully on God for it, and their failures showed for their lack of prayer. You know, the faith which we are to have is not a faith in and of ourselves. It is a faith that has an object, and that object is Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. We need to understand who he is. The world around us needs Jesus and not us. He is the effective mover, not us. It is not the pastor. It is not the evangelist. It is not the specialist. It's not the lay person. It is Jesus Christ. And we do the best ministry when we point people to Jesus and not ourselves. Warren Wiersbe, a great pastor in the Midwest... He had a number of uh, very significant ministries, and I, he's got this nice little book. Uh, I think it's called On Being a Minister. I think that's what it's called. Um, but he has this lovely definition of what is ministry. And he says this, or he writes this, Ministry takes place. Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Now, isn't that good? Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. It does not say that ministry takes place when we give a good message. It's not what it says. Now, a good message may be, if it's based upon Scripture, a divine resource. If it is bathed in prayer, it may be a divine resource. If it is empowered by the Holy Spirit, it may be a divine resource. But if it is designed, or if it is, if it is all about, uh, let's put three points together in a poem and make something real pretty, make sure that it's really good for television, then it's not ministry. We are involved, whether we have a, a vocation as a pastor or whether we are as lay people, we are, in the, we are designed to be people to bring Jesus to people. And if we are not bringing Jesus to people, we are not doing our job. That's all there is to it. This kind cannot be driven out but by anything but prayer. Let me propose this to you, that prayer is probably one of the most... Prayer is a, is a difficulty. Prayer is oftentimes hard. Oh, we have to set time aside. I have to, I have to wait, and, I, and now I come and I'm praying to God. And it's difficult because we don't see immediate reactions oftentimes. 
Sometimes we are asked to pray for years and years and years before God moves. At times we say, why do I bother praying? Because I haven't had the answer I wanted yet. Right? And yet, prayer is an expression of faith. And once again, Hebrews 11, 6, 8, it is impossible to please him without faith. Here we have Jesus, and he's coming off the mountain, and he comes down into the valley because ministry is done in the valley. It's not done on the mountaintop. It's done upon the dangerous slopes. It's done down in the valley. And here comes Jesus, and he comes, and he sees immediately a problem. And what does he do? He brings divine resources, meets human needs, lovingly to the glory of his Father. That's ministry. Ministry, if it lives up to the name, is God's work, where we get the minuscule but glorious privilege of being used by God. Isn't that a great prayer that you can have? Oh, God, use me. Help me be, to be the channel. Help me to be the tool. Help me, help me show the world who you are. Jesus, if you, if you can, if I can, oh boy, I can. I can do all things. You can do all things if you believe as they correspond to God's will. As people of faith, we worship the one who can. That's who we have. Can I encourage you this week? Make this a week where you dedicate yourself more to prayer, dedicating yourself more to the idea of surrender of yourself, asking God to take you more and more out of the center of things and putting him more and more into the center. Can I ask that God uses you more in the valley than desiring always to be on the mountaintop? Say, Lord, I don't know what you have for me, but I want to be used by you. And I, I, I know that we live in a screwed up world right now. And what the world needs is not a new political person or not an old political person. They need Jesus Christ. And can you please use me that I might present him to other people? Let me encourage you to do that. I mean, that's what I'm going to be doing. Pray that God would let you effectively minister to bring his word, to bring his truth, to people who are in need. That's ministry. See? That's what we're called to do. And why are we called to do it? Because Jesus can. And we point people to him.